This is the 5 minute guide to the Lord Nelson class, the last pre-dreadnoughts of the British Royal Navy. Although the Lord Nelson class would have the distinction of being the last pre-dreadnought battleships, somewhat ironically for the nation that actually launched HMS Dreadnought, they were finished afterwards. There's a little bit of detail to that of course. The Lord Nelson class were designed in the period immediately after the conclusion of the Russo-Japanese War of 1904 and 1905, and of course the Battle of Tsushima that went with it. As had been anticipated by the Royal Navy, this battle had shown that the range at which engagements took place was actually significantly higher than many had expected it to be in the years before. This suggested that in the near future, the typical secondary batteries equipped on pre-dreadnought battleships might become useless as they wouldn't be able to range out to a sufficient distance to engage the enemy. However, since the main battery of most pre-dreadnoughts still had a relatively low rate of fire, there were concerns that in non-ideal circumstances for a fleet engagement, such as fog, darkness or rain, an enemy fleet might be able to sneak close enough to still use the, that smaller caliber secondary battery to overwhelm a ship that was perhaps armed solely with large guns. As it turned out, technological improvements to improve the rate of fire of the main battery guns of battleships rendered most of these concerns obsolete within the space of a couple of years. But it was in that space that these ships took shape. As mentioned, the Royal Navy had already been expecting an extension to main battle range, and so some of their ships, including the King Edward VII class pre-dreadnoughts, had introduced a intermediate 9.2-inch battery, as well as the 6-inch secondary battery that was common on a lot of pre-dreadnought ships. However, with a new designer on board, the Royal Navy would take the Lord Nelsons to the next logical step, before the all-big gun arrangement of HMS Dreadnought. This thinking was not completely unique to the Royal Navy, as can be seen in the design of the French Danton pre-dreadnoughts of the Marine Nationale, and the Satsuma-class pre-dreadnoughts of the Imperial Japanese Navy. This dispensed entirely with the previous secondary battery arrangement of medium-calibre guns, and substituted it instead for an intermediate battery, which furthermore abandoned the casement mount for side guns in favour of turret mountings. This in turn gave the guns a much greater arc of fire, the ability to elevate further and therefore shoot further, and it kept them clear of the weather in most situations, which made them much more manageable and much more usable in sea states outside of flat calm. The main guns were also upgraded with a new 12-inch 45 calibre gun, mounted in a pair of twin turrets, one forward and one aft in the traditional pre-dreadnought configuration. This main battery was complemented by an intermediate battery with a total of 10 9.2-inch guns in four twin and two single turrets, mounted on the wings with two twins and a single on each side. 24 single 12-pounder guns for anti-destroyer work, a couple of 3-pounder guns that were mostly there for saluting work, and five 18-inch torpedo tubes rounded out the ship's armament. They were also much more heavily armoured than all previous pre-dreadnoughts of the Royal Navy, with a main belt that went up to 12-inch thickness. A total of 15 hybrid boilers, primarily using coal but with oil spraying to increase their power and efficiency, drove two propeller shafts which led to the ships having a to maximum top speed of 18 knots, which was fairly respectable for a vessel using vertical triple expansion engines. Another innovation introduced to the British Navy was that the bulkheads that ran along the ship to keep it from flooding were completely solid, with no doors or any other openings. Originally, the intermediate battery was to have been 12 9.2-inch guns in six twin turrets, however, a desire to get these ships into dry docks and ports that had previously been unavailable to the last few generations of pre-dreadnoughts meant they actually came out slightly shorter than their immediate predecessors and required the reduction of the central wing turret from a twin to a single. Although their hybrid propulsion arrangement proved to be a fairly successful endeavour, with both ships comfortably exceeding their target speed on trials, their main armament and intermediate battery was somewhat less of a success. This was because the 9.2-inch gun fired shells large enough that at long range it was very difficult to tell the difference between the 9.2-inch shell splashes and the 12-inch shell splashes. 
this was something of a problem as obviously the two guns had completely different ballistics and so you needed to work out which particular shell had gone long or short or was on target in order to correct the correct battery. We mentioned at the outset of the video that the ships entered service after HMS Dreadnought and that was because their main battery was exactly the same gun, turret and barbette arrangement as that planned for HMS Dreadnought. So when HMS Dreadnought was being built and they wanted to finish it as fast as possible, it got the high priority and the guns and turrets that had initially been earmarked for the Lord Nelson and its sister ship HMS Agamemnon were effectively stolen and installed on HMS Dreadnought instead. Since, as we said, they were identical, it didn't matter that much that the later turrets wound up on the pre-Dreadnoughts, but it did mean their completion was delayed. In order to keep the Grand Fleet's battle speed above 20 knots, both ships were dispatched to the Channel Fleet at the start of World War I. As a result, their first action, as it were, was to guard the British Expeditionary Force as they crossed the Channel into France. The next year, they were still in the Channel, but they, it was decided to send the ships to attack the Dardanelles, first Agamemnon and then Lord Nelson after HMS Queen Elizabeth was damaged in operations there. Both ships would be struck repeatedly by heavy shells from the Turkish fortifications, but came out relatively intact with the crew suffering only slight wounds. They continued to lead relatively charmed lives, although taking part in attacks where other pre-dreadnought battleships were sunk, and despite sustaining numerous hits, the two ships were never seriously damaged or in danger of sinking. Following the failure of the Gallipoli campaign, although all the other British pre-dreadnoughts were sent home, the two Lord Nelsons were left to guard the Dardanelles against the possible breakout of the Yevet Sultan Selim, uh, the ex-German battlecruiser Goben. This confrontation nearly happened on the 20th of January 1918, but both ex-German ships hit mines, with the ex-Breslau sinking and the ex-Goben having to retire. As a result of their presence, the Turkish armistice would be signed aboard Agamemnon, and they would then enter Constantinople. After the war, Lord Nelson was scrapped in 1920, whilst Agamemnon survived as a radio-controlled target ship until 1927, being the last pre-dreadnought in the British fleet. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to tag your question with Q&A if you want to leave a question for the dry dock.